You've probably heard of the assassination of Shinzo Abe, right? But you probably don't know why his murder shocked so many people and that's why we'll tell you in a second. But let us introduce ourselves first. World's News is a channel dedicated to delivering news on a weekly basis. Within each video, we try to pick out the most important or funniest news and explain their origins, development, as well as possible outcomes to inform you about the world you're living in. But let's hear about the assassination of an ex-prime minister of Japan. This Friday, ex-prime minister of Japan Shinzo Abe was assassinated in Nara, Japan during a speech he gave for the upcoming national elections. But what did Shinzo Abe do to deserve that? As said, Mr. Abe used to be Prime Minister of Japan. He served the office longer than anyone before stepping down in 2020. He also served as President of the Liberal Democratic Party or LDP for over 10 years. But looking back at his career, we couldn't find a reason for his death. Most assassinations of politicians are connected to dirty things they did, such as being a fraud or being corrupt. But apart from the cherry blossom scandal, which wasn't that bad, we really couldn't find any allegations which a person could use to justify murdering someone. Then why was he killed? Well, apparently, the shooter later told the police that he was, quote, dissatisfied with the ex-prime minister and therefore wanted to get rid of him. His murderer, a 41-year-old man who had served in the Japanese military, didn't even have other political beliefs. He just wanted to kill Shinzo Abe. Although there are rumors that he killed him out of a religious motive, but that wasn't confirmed yet. And so, Mr. Abe was fatally shot in the back while giving an electoral speech. His murderer was tackled down and arrested immediately, but the doctors couldn't save him. So Shinzo Abe died of a cardiac arrest during surgery. Now, apart from the fact that he was a very important politician and mostly liked among the Japanese, many people were shocked by this cruel murder. Most people had thought that Japan had overcome the age of political assassinations. Inijiro Sanma, the then head of the Japan Socialist Party, was the last high-profile Japanese politician to be killed in a stabbing in 1960. That was over 60 years ago. This is gruesome, that we live in a society that didn't overcome such primitive ways of handling one's problems. I mean, of course, most people would never do that. But yes, on the other hand, every person could become a murderer every day if the right or more if the wrong conditions are given. But simply killing someone out of a mood is something that we need to extinguish from our modern society as fast as possible. This could also prevent things like the Russia-Ukrainian war from happening. But maybe that's just me thinking wishfully. Oh, and while we are at it, what is going on in the Russia-Ukrainian war? It's been a while since we last heard about this conflict as a own topic here on World's News. That is because there were no major developments in the Russia-Ukrainian war. But let's look at the things which did happen in the last few weeks. So, unfortunately, Ukrainian cities are still under shelling on a daily basis. Airstrikes keep killing civilians and the few people who move back to Ukraine or who never left live in a country with little infrastructure. Some cities don't have fresh water and almost every city slowly runs out of food, let alone medical conditions. Apart from that, there are by far not enough doctors in Ukraine to actively help wounded soldiers on the battlefield or to provide healthcare to civilians. But let's have a look at the battlefield as a whole. As you can see, Russia keeps pushing forward. The Donbass region, which had been a Russian-backed separatist-held area before the war, is now under broad Russian military control. Generally speaking, Russia is pushing further and further into the country, slowly expanding territory under their control. But Ukraine achieves many things too. Shortly after the war began, Russian forces took over Snake Island, a little piece of land in the Black Sea but of high strategic value to the Russians. By stationing military equipment there, the Russian Navy could contribute to the bombardment of Ukraine with cruise missiles, which are low-flying missiles guided to its target by an onboard computer. Apart from that, the Russian military was able to threaten Odessa with an amphibious assault and the Russian Navy could deny access to and from Ukrainian ports, therefore blocking Ukraine. This was one of the reasons for severe grain shortages in many countries, as shipping is one of the most efficient and common methods of transporting such goods out in the world. So this liberation of Snake Islands' only purpose was to get rid of Russia. In fact, Ukraine isn't expected to station many troops there, just enough to keep the Russian military away. 
And as we have a look at Russia's losses, we see that they lose more and more resources, whether it is actual soldiers or just equipment. But their clinch continues and we'll probably have to accept that the cost of living crisis will continue as well. But until there are more major developments in this conflict, that's it from our side. If you have any questions though, please let us know in the comments and we'll try to answer them as good as possible. Speaking of the war, lots of countries like Finland for example still buy and use Russian gas and oil. This causes the green energy discussion to be drawn into sharp focus. Now an innovation called sand battery is said to bring the use of green energies a step further. So could sand batteries solve one of green energy's problems? First of all, what problem of green energy should be solved? Well, a big question with this energy is how we can get a year-round supply of green energy. In summer, the days are long and solar modules can therefore create much energy. This isn't the case in winter though. While there are parts on earth where winter doesn't get much colder than summer on other parts of our world, there are also countries where there's only few hours of sun per winter day. That is if there's sun at all. And one of these countries is Finland. So we see that at the moment Finland depends on Russian gas, especially in winter. But sand batteries are supposed to solve this problem and they function like this. They are basically big cylinders filled with low grade sand. But why sand? Well, first, sand is among the most common resources on Earth. And second, if we have a look at the specific heat capacity of sand, which tells us how much energy in form of heat a material can store, we see that it is quite high. So sand has also great physical properties to fulfill this job to our satisfaction. Anyways, these cylinders of sand are supposed to store energy in form of heat at around 500 degrees Celsius or 932 degrees Fahrenheit. Then in winter, this can be used to warm up water which is then used to keep our Finnish friends warm or any household connected to the system. So yeah, this seems logical and I think that we can make good use of this concept in the future. Scientists are even researching whether this method can be used to gain electricity as well. But until now, there are no promising results concerning that. And apart from that, this is definitely not green energy's final form either. These were the past week's news. If you want to support us, you know what to do. But now to this week's bonus fact. You all know Osama Bin Laden, right? No, not the terrorist, the elephant. According to Wikipedia, Osama Bin Laden was a rogue bull elephant named after the terrorist leader Osama Bin Laden. He was responsible for at least 27 deaths and destruction of property in the jungle Sonatpur district of the Indian state of Assam. After a two-year rampage from 2004 to 2006, the elephant was eventually shot, though some were doubtful that the correct animal had been killed. 